let's talk about Paul. But before we actually get into Paul, I wanted to allow you two gentlemen to maybe tell us, how can we understand Paul? He's been orthodoxed, if I could use the term, if that's even an accurate term. He has been painted in a certain way by tradition. But when I read your book earlier, Paul and Jesus, right, listening to it in Audible, reading your book, Becoming Divine, Dr. Litwa, Paul's Ascent to Paradise, Dr. Tabor, what is going on with this, this person we call Paul? I let James go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I focus uh, quite a bit on Paul. God, I don't want to name the years. It's too many decades. But I studied uh, at the University of Chicago in the 70s. So at least uh, I'll date myself there a little bit <laughs> with Jonathan Z. Smith, whom David and I both consider just the master of masters, the wizard of Hellenistic religions. And he would uh, want to say that if you approach Paul, back off quite a bit and talk about the ancient Mediterranean world. And the reason my work intersects so well with David's work, just look at the titles of his book, his books rather, not his book, many books, Mediterranean myths, Mediterranean thought. And that's really the high-end training at the PhD level now that people get. That is, you don't just microscopically work on a couple chapters of the New Testament all your life, but you try to back off and understand the world of Paul. And I don't mean just the political social world. Usually when you talk about the world of Paul, I think, People think, oh, you mean like he, he was a, maybe a Roman citizen, maybe not, according to Acts, but he never mentions it. And you kind of do this bio-sociological thing with Paul, and that's all valid. But to me, it's Paul the myth maker, Paul the mystical ascender to heaven, the one who heard and saw things unutterable, and that's what the book is uh, Paul's Ascent to Paradise, which was, this is a version of my dissertation that I did years ago. But the reason I mentioned Jonathan Z. Smith, uh, Google him, he's amazing. Uh, he died a few years ago. Uh, but I was the first student to work on a New Testament text with him, you know, or a New Testament subject, rather. And he insisted, like, yeah, you're doing New Testament, but you could have just as uh, as well chosen Lucian, uh, the satirist of the Roman world, or you could talk about uh, the Mithras liturgy, which is part of the great, you know, Paris magical papyri, or you could do Pymandris, that's from the from the Corpus Hermetica. There's his idea was let's talk about ways of being religious in the Hellenistic period, and not segregate this one character off in that way. But at this point, all I would want to say is we're just going to take a wide view. We really, really agree on this. And we want to ask, what is salvation for Paul? Because for Paul, salvation is not just uh, judicial, like, oh, my sins are forgiven. That's the way it's usually seen today. Salvation is how are you going to live in this trapped in this lower cosmos with all the angels and principalities bearing down upon you and how are you ever going to be able to send out of this and join the you know the ultimate god who is beyond all gods and so forth and so we want to contextualize him in that broad theological you could call it theology probably I should just say conceptual mythological way often called the mysticism of paul I love Schweitzer's book. I dedicated my dissertation to Schweitzer and both of my and my Paul book, because um, everybody knows uh, in English at least "Quest of the Historical Jesus," but who knows that wonderful book, "The Mysticism of Paul the Apostle," and we didn't even have the Dead Sea Scrolls. But he said, you know, if you want to understand Paul, yeah, your sins are forgiven. Yeah, the blood of Christ. You know, Romans three and so forth. But how about Romans 8? What's wrong with the cosmos? Mm -hmm. And what's wrong with your body? 
your mortal body so that the good that you would, you do not, and the evil that you would not, that you do. You know, what's going on there? So that's what I would say as an introduction to, that we want to put Paul in his conceptual world. And if you do that, the inside is just like a, a spotlight. You, f you finally understand. Because Paul has been Lutheranized and Catholicized and what was your verb you created? Orthodox. Or, orthodoxy. Or <laughs> yeah, he's been orthodoxy. And you know, if you ask him, he would go, you know, no, I'm just like a stranger in a strange land who's trying to get back to God, where because the creation, you know, Satan's the God of the world. He says that, Galatians 4:4. 4, 4. I can quote the scriptures like football signals because I was raised uh, evangelical, just like you, Derek. <laughs> So, you know, uh, I can just spin those things out, you know. So Satan's the god of this world, and the principalities and powers are bearing down. So that would be my way of starting. We're going to talk about ascent to heaven and deification, but but we need to look at salvation is like uh, uh, Smith would always say, it's, it's, it's like getting away and escaping from the world of sin, the flesh, and from death. But it's a Hebrewized view of it because he is Jewish, you know, in his concepts. So, mm, 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 so David, sorry to go so long there, but jump in. and No, that's know. fine. I think for your viewers, it's really important to understand the politics of Pauline interpretation. Very first of all, Paul has been protected. Um, re reading Paul uh, within the Orthodox tradition protects Paul in many ways from the Greco-Roman world. And those who are opponents of the Greco-Roman world still dismiss it today as pagan, which always has carried a negative edge and has always been used in Christian apologetics to say, this is the stuff that's bad. So if Paul is put in touch, Paul is the genius of Christianity as usually taken, but if Paul is put in touch with all this pagan stuff, then all of a sudden Christianity is in danger. So the politics of it is to, is to protect Paul, to protect Paul with Judaism or, or more properly speaking, our modern constructions of mm -hmm. Judaism as something already somehow, some way, not hermetically sealed off, but in some way protected from the larger Greco-Roman world. And part of this is, you know, the major context for understanding Paul among the Orthodox tradition is simply to look at the Old Testament. And this is a highly political way of, of doing it because, you know, there have been countless and countless studies and books on Paul and of finding the Old Testament in the New. And why is that? Because it protects Paul. Reading Paul in light of the, the Christian Old Testament makes Paul already seem like he is isolated from the larger streams of uh, Greco-Roman thinking. And that just is not true. There was in the late 19th and early 20th century, a very important school in Germany called the Relig Religionsgeschichtliche Schule. And in this school, they emphasized not only to look at Paul in terms of religious practice, but also to look at Paul in, in terms of the Greco-Roman environment and all aspects of that environment, not just the high elite writers like Cicero, but also things like the Greek magical papyri and the Hermetic authors mentioned by James, Gnostic Mendean texts, and simply Greco-Roman mythology. All this was fair game. And then, in the mid 20th century, there was this enormous backlash against uh, in, in neo-orthodoxy. There was an, an enormous backlash against viewing Paul in this way, in this context. And ever since then, we I mean, things have gotten so varied right now. We can't tell a one continuous narrative. But ever since then, there has been always, even today, a strong emphasis on protecting Paul. Now, just to clarify, I don't have any any problem at all viewing Paul within a so-called Jewish context or Judaism or Judaisms. But the, the thing to keep in mind here, folks, is that Judaism is itself just another Hellenic religion. At least that's 
how I'm theorizing and viewing it. It isn't an exception. And we can't submit to a kind of Christian exceptionalism, which then, you know, Christians have invented the Judeo-Christian tradition. The Jews don't, you know, have didn't invent that. The Christians invented that. So they take Judaism and their reconstruction of Judaism as a partner. And they say that this is the buffer that can protect Paul and Jesus, by the way, from the Greco-Roman world. And that model of understanding is an apologetic model that goes back thousands of years and must be resisted at all costs. Hmm. Boy, Let me give a quick shout out. Let me give a quick yeah. shout out to some of these people who've uh, shown some support. Gnostic Informant, thank you for the support. Derek's ascent into the Elysian Fields. Thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate that support. Doc Pleromanot with the 20. Thank you for that support. Number one, Paul echoes Jewish apocalypticism in 1 Corinthians 2, 6-13, namely the revelation given to Enoch by the angel Uriel. Could he also be drawing from Hecalot treatises or treatises for these wisdom and cosmology traditions? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Uh, sure. it, in the, the, the book, uh, the new book, uh, Paul's Ascent to Paradise, I do talk about Hekelot, Rabati, and other kinds of mystical traditions uh, within Judaism. But just as David said, those have to also be not hermetically sealed off. M many of them are later, but we find within Mishnaic uh, stories that we think go back to the first and second century CE. Uh, the four rabbis who ascend to paradise and how you take that and what happens to them and so forth. So, yes, absolutely, uh, that that material is in the air. But, you know, you've read a bit of my book, Derek, you said you're still working through it, mm -hmm. but Poimandris and the Mithras liturgy are not that different from Hekelot Rabati. And I've just crossed about three different cultures here because the <laughs> The contextual uh, obstacles that you have to, quote, overcome to be saved uh, are very, very similar. The agents are different, of course, and some of the other things. I wanted to tell David, though, I, I couldn't help remembering my fear and trembling. I was 27 years old. I arrived at the University of Chicago, and I had a master's degree from Pepperdine University in Bible. And Pepperdine's a decent place, and I studied with good people there. I majored in classics in college, and I met with uh, Jonathan Smith. I wanted to study with him, and he said, have you read Richard Reitzenstein? And David knows exactly what I'm talking about. Now, there is an English translation, but he meant like auf Deutsch bitte, like have you read Hellenistische Mysterien Religionen? And I said, no. Now, guess what? I'd never even heard of Reitzenstein. Not that I hadn't read it. And then he started naming a bunch of other writers. Uh, I had heard of A.D. Nock, thank God, who's the greatest of the great in, in a Harvard guy. I could tell you Nock stories all day. I didn't study with him. Uh, but I didn't know Martin Smith. I didn't know any of these people. So I was just such a babe in the woods. What did I know? I knew the New Testament really well, and I knew the Greek, and I knew, you know, kind of standard theological interpretations. So my world just exploded because the first course I took was called Hellenistic Religions. And Jonathan started with an ancient Near Eastern story called the Pickaxe. It's Egyptian. No, it's not. It's Akkadian. And I thought, why are you beginning there? Eventually, I began to figure out what he was doing. He's trying to show you how in the ancient Near East, the, the world of the Hebrew Bible, things are in place. Things are settled. The cosmos makes sense. Remember, Rahab has been chopped up into pieces. The sea's not going to come in and flood. And he wanted to set the stage for the disruption that began to take place in the Hellenistic world following Alexander, and I'm not just attributing it to Alexander, but this sense of feeling alienation, it's actually kind of akin to modern existentialism, although it rests upon different pillars. But it's this idea of basically strangers in a strange land. You know, how did we get here? From whence have we fallen? 
Where are we headed? What is behind? What is ahead? The mysteries of the cosmos, the things that you've delved into, Derek. Uh, this is just part and parcel of the Hellenistic world. Now, the Platonists, uh, many of your listeners, I'm sure, and viewers have maybe dabbled with Plato and the Timaeus. But the Timaeus is simply a, another version of this, this, this whole tale of alienation. So Paul is really telling you, it, it's not just like, how do I get saved by the blood of Christ? The way Christians today would probably define, you know, Paul's teaching. Like you're a sinner and Christ died for your sins. And if you turn to Christ, he'll forgive you. And when you go, die, you'll go to heaven. That is so far from Paul. Paul wants to see the cosmos saved. You understand? The physical creation, he says, is groaning in travail until it's birth into what it's supposed to be. It's like an embryo, Romans 8. And then he talks about uh, individuals uh, that follow Christ are going to become the firstborn of this new family of cosmic beings. And you never hear that talked about. <laughs> yeah, like, like this is so <laughs> foreign from what I was raised with. You're, you've committed at least 30 heresies uh, This into, like just talking in the past five minutes. I mean, this well, is it, a lot of it goes to Luther and Augustine <laughs> because they're obsessed with their sexual failures. Uh, I don't know about Luther's sex life. Maybe he had other failures, but they there was this sense that, uh, you know, E.P. Sanders, you, you know, his book, uh, mm -hmm. Paul and Rabbinic Judaism and so forth. He he made this point that the whole introspective, and this is also Stendhal, Paul and the Introspective Conscience of the Western World, just a groundbreaking book, that Paul's not really about, I mean, he he's about it and not about it. He's not about it, capital A, about. What do I do with your guilt-ridden, sinful self? That can be blotted out. The real question is, you're a mortal. You're going to die. You're in the flesh. The universe is dying. This is a mortal world, and we're down at the lowest level. You understand? The earth is the lowest level of the cosmos. There's seven levels above, and then even the ultimate eighth beyond that. That's the problem. And Sanders said this. He calls it the judicial idea of Christianity. It's a court scene. You've got sins. You've been called up to the judge's bench. You're going to de get declared guilty or not guilty and sentenced. And then it's it's viewed like that. And you go, oh, thank God I got a pardon. I get to go free. Well, you know, that's that's not really what Paul is about. Let's see you uh, ascend to heaven one foot. <laughs> you know, jump in the air and you're going to come right back down on the earth, you know. So Paul is about how is this created world subject to futility by God. It's kind of a mock-up of a future possible new creation. And he's taking Hebrew Bible concepts like the creation of the new heavens and new earth and so forth. But he's implying he's applying them within this Hellenistic matrix. Mm. And we can go into all kinds of other texts and uh, we'll get into his ascent to paradise. But David and I totally agree on this broader context. Yeah. And, you know, usually, I mean, go to the SBL, Society of Biblical Literature, David and I go all the time. Half the papers on Paul are going to be like uh, sacred meals in 1 Corinthians 11, you know, which is fine. We need to know the Hellenistic background of things like that. But very seldom would you have a paper on Paul's cosmos and how to negotiate your way within it. You know, because you realize these powers can zap you really badly. You know, the guy living with his father's wife in 1 Corinthians 5, he's kicked out. But did you notice Paul says, when you're assembled together in the name of the Lord Jesus and, and his spirit is present, and then he goes, and my spirit is present. What's he projecting his spirit into the little house church at Corinth? He goes, deliver this guy to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit can be saved in the day of the Lord. What? Let's talk about that a little bit. <laughs> no, because if you get kicked out of the little circle of the protected ones, you, the God of this world that is Satan, the principalities and powers, where they're going to have their way with you. It's a very scary thing. 
So, okay, uh, just real quick, Dr. Litwa, did we address, I know that um, Dr. Tabor actually gave us the background and crossed multiple cultures, just pointing out a few examples. Um, but did you directly have an answer to the super chat? And Yep, just real quick. Uh, I've always appreciated Dr. Player Romana, your you're always on the money. And so comparing the Heckelo as a as a comparandum is good, but chronologically, the Heckelo, like most rabbinic literature, is going to be a late antique uh, literature, which means it's going to be several hundred years beyond Paul. But Enoch, Enoch is really, really important. And I would say for most late first and second century Christians, Enoch is scripture, by which I mean first Enoch. And um, so, and we see that in Jude, which which the only scripture that it quotes is, is Enoch, okay? So we know that it's extremely important, and we know that Enoch's ascent to heaven forms a kind of model, not only for later renditions of Jesus' ascent to heaven, but for Paul himself. So Paul, even though he, he doesn't really mention Enoch, those Enochic traditions, which are 100 years before Paul, it really seeped into the cultural bedrock. And that is absolutely key for comparing Paul's own e experience. The myth of Enoch had formed the mysticism of Paul. Mm. Yes. Doc also comes in and says, is the added variant at the end of Romans 16, 25 through 27, a later harmonization to these traditions? Do I need to pull up the scriptures? Uh I know that's all the greetings. Uh, let me just look at that uh, and see here if I got a text handy. Uh, and, uh, we remember that, David, exactly those verses? Uh, yeah, so it's the kind of concluding doxology. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Go ahead. And uh, I mean, it's to the one who has enabled us to, to the one who has enabled you to stand firm. Um, mm -hmm going on and so forth, uh, to the only wise God, Jesus Christ. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the issue here with this in the manuscripts is, if I understand Doc Plerum's question, that yeah, right. some of the Enochic material may be influencing this particular doxography, maybe even, you know, sort of uh, getting into the Heckle literature as well. To be honest, I'm not sure I can answer that question really quick, though, because I would need to really study those particular verses in order to get at the detail. Okay. And the translation, too, because whether to the only wise God be glory forever through Christ, you know, whether it's agency or something of that nature. Let me read. Is it a later harmonization to these traditions? Um. To, I like, think it's the Enochian. He might be tying back to the Enochian. The Enochian, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I think that's what he means. It was a really big moment when uh, the Qumran scrolls were discovered, and we did find fragments of Enoch in Aramaic that Michael Stone has now dated to the 3rd century BC. So you certainly, David's right, you cannot jump from, say, Aramaic Enoch at Qumran to 300 CE and 400 CE and 500 CE with uh, uh, Sefer Harazim or Hekelot Rabati, these texts. I did use them in my dissertation, but not with the idea that Paul knew those texts or knew them, but that they or, or copied them or used them, but that they're coming out of the same stream of right. thought which is essentially a, a, a Jew, what we usually call a Jewish form of mysticism. So, I like that. I like that. Yeah. All right. Jim Wils, uh, Jim Wiseman, I think it is. Wiseman. Uh, who was the greatest apostle? Yeah. Who was the greatest apostle? John, Paul, George, or Ringo? Love y'all. Boy, boy, that's <laughs> tough. That's tough. But, you know. Thank you for that. Yeah. I, I, I mean, wonder if he thinks Ringo because I see the caps there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I want to I want to give a quick uh, shout out to Jojo Freelancer. Don't worry, my friend. I saw your message, but uh, I literally was busy uh, trying to take care of something here. And he has a question. Uh, he's specifically addressing someone. This is when you brought up the seven levels of heaven, right, with Paul. 
So um, there's a Christian apologist who like is criticizing Islam. His name is Jay Smith. And uh, he's, he's criticizing Islam about the seven or six heavens and earths. Why does his Bible say that St. Paul went to heaven? And where does the idea of numbering of the heavens come from? So it's almost like, let me try and phrase the question in another way, because I know that there's a language barrier there. The Christian is criticizing the Muslim about the seven heavens and the seven earths. Does he have ground to stand on or does not Paul believe in something like this? Is there something to it? I don't know. Where's this tradition? Do you have any idea? Because I know Islam is not your forte, um, but I don't know much about uh, the Islamic side of it. But of course, the Greek Hellenistic side would correlate with the seven planetary spheres and the sun and moon are included in that. And the idea, uh, this is just uh, as scientific to the ancient Hellenist as uh our Copernican universe is to us, you know, that the earth goes around the sun and so forth. It's just, just a fact. So it wouldn't surprise me if, Mo but I'm not sure if that's what Muhammad or the Quran or whatever text it is, is referring to that you would have that number seven. Maybe they're associated with the planetary spheres, but these are levels. Paul usually doesn't use that term, but he uses heights, depths, Depths are under the earth, the world of the dead, the chthonic deities. Heights are all the way up. And then principalities and powers. At the end of Romans 8, remember, he ticks them all off. And the idea is that Jesus has conquered all of these spheres and been immortalized or deified. And I want to be sure we get into Philippians 2 later. I don't yeah. want to do it now. But I don't even think it's about a preexistent uh Jesus, but we can talk about that. Talk uh, about it. What do you but, think but about it? But I'm not it? sure then... whether, uh, I'm not, sh I don't know. David, do you know more about the uh, the idea of seven earths and seven heavens in Islamic tradition to help address that in, question? Not, not in Islam, but one thing I would point out in giving the context of this is that Jews, Christians, and other Hellen Hellenic peoples in the Greco-Roman world they believed in multi-layered heavens, but typically they couldn't agree. So, for instance, yeah. in Paul's case, uh, he says he goes to the third heaven and enters paradise. Does that mean that paradise is the top level, in which case there would be three levels of heaven? What about seven levels? The ascension of Isaiah in the early second century has exactly seven mm. levels of heaven. But then when you turn over to Second Enoch, which scholars have hypothesized was written in late first century Alexandria, all of a sudden we have 10 heavens. And when you turn to the letter of Eugnostus, which is in Nagamati, then you've got 360. And Irenaeus <laughs> says that Basilides had 365 heavens for the obvious reason of representing the days of the, of the year. So... This is something that's really intriguing that that early early uh, people in antiquity they they certainly agreed in a multi level level heaven, but they wrangled about how many layers there were. And the reason I think this is, is significant is is because there there is in in a sense tremendous agreement that there are real cosmic spaces up there, and they're not they're not different dimensions that that is there there you don't go into like a, a fifth dimension they are real cosmic spaces and and they and they did i think it's fair to say think that if you had a means of taking some kind of a spaceship that you could go up and, and ascend to those levels because Lucian makes fun of this in in his mm -hmm. in his book True True Histories. Uh, are you familiar with Lucian, Derek? Are you familiar? Yes, I, he's the one who does the comedy on. Yes, yeah. isn't he oh, cracking God. jokes on Christians? He's the, the only ancient writer uh, in this genre, at least, that can I can be sitting alone, nobody around reading my low classic, I just break out with a belly laugh that's just obscene, you know, because he's so funny. 
So I just wondered if you had delved into that. Yeah. I have not read it for myself, but I know of, I know of. But, yeah, David it obviously is correct. And in, in, in my book, Paul's Ascent to Paradise, I try to meticulously go through all, most of many of the major traditions. Uh, I don't get into the Nag Hammadi and later, but first, so-called first Enoch, second Enoch, uh, ascension of Isaiah and so forth. And yeah, you've got this variation. And it is hard to tell. Uh, I, I kind of uh, skirt the question in my book because is, as David said, is, is he enters paradise. That's the main thing. Uh, but then paradise is the world of the dead in some of these traditions, you know, where the souls of the righteous are waiting. And in older traditions, they're down below the earth and they have to, the dead in Christ rise up, you know, to meet the Lord in the air, by the way. And the air is, is the lower atmosphere, I guess we would call it, but it's not a very safe place because there's just tons of devils and demons and spirits running around, good and bad. Uh, remember Frank Cross said years ago, and it was really uh, bad of him to say because he used a cat as an example. And I happen to love dogs and cats, but he said, you couldn't even swing a cat by its tail in the ancient world without knocking out 10 or 20 spirit beings. You know, he, but he's just making the point that it, it's a different world. It's a world that maybe Pentecostal Christians and uh, people that know that tradition, like if your car won't start after church, there's a reason. Yeah, Satan's trying to stop yeah, you. Or yeah, and Paul demon. says he's going to make a trip, and he goes, you know, I planned to come to you once, twice, but Satan hindered me. Now, that could have been he went down to the dock, and he planned to take a certain ship, and they go, well, that's full. You know, we can't take anybody else. <laughs> Satan had some extra people join I mean, this is the world that he's in. It's, it's, I would call it a mystical, magical world. I know the word magic for some people uh, is a problem because they, the old dichotomy, the old, what David was talking about, the hermetically sealed dichotomy was there's religion, which is devotion. That's the real stuff, like true religion, faith, Old Testament, New Testament, Hebrew Bible. And then there's the pagan stuff, that's magic. You see, and as Morton Smith said, you know, one person's religion is another person's magic. And Durkheim said there's no church of magic. So magic is really a way of referring to what your enemies do. Mm -hmm. You know, if Jesus is spitting on the ground and making mud and touching eyes and saying Ephrata and stuff like that, that's not magic. That's like religious healing, you see. But if uh, Sclapius does it or if uh, Apollonius of Tyana does it, like, look at that pagan, you know, he's using magic. <laughs> and you say, well, spells, that's magic. Are you kidding me? You don't think Paul curses people from a distance? Put he literally spells? says, or he says it in Galatians 1, pretty, we yeah. always take it and like anachronistically think like, curse them, like, 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 ah, screw that guy. But no, like. Well, this when you guy is probably wishing like yeah. spiritual powers. The guy going, living, like, First Corinthians five, the guy living with his father's wife to deliver him to Satan is putting a magical curse on him. If you don't like the word magic, a spiritual curse. Now, there's the whole point is, and then the other thing is, oh, magic requires paraphernalia. It's like a little little trick box, and you pull out, you know little maybe a feather and some bat blood and you know this kind of stuff that's magic and religion is just piously sitting and worshiping god and you know that's okay but you know what you find in in like poimandras and and especially poimandras which is the hermetic uh, text of his, uh, the revelation of ascent to heaven i cover in the book there's no paraphernalia whatsoever you literally kind of go like this and go into a kind of meditation and you begin to go up, but you got to know what you're doing and what you have, you know, the only indication we have in um, uh, the golden ass or metamorphoses Apuleius as to what happened even in the Osiris religion. Remember is you, 
you you go to the world below and the world above and you greet all the gods face to face and we've got these golden plates do you know about the golden plates the little they're it's probably i don't mean mormon golden you know. foil they're they're these 17 inscriptions that have been found it, it'd be like rolling up a little gold foil and you put it by the ear of the deceased in a tomb there are probably thousands of them but 17 have been found and basically it's telling you how to negotiate the world of it's the world below because it's uh, third century bc but it's the same idea and it says that you 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 show some spunk with these these forces like if you're a christian i picture you would say uh i'm going up and I declare in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who rules all the spheres of the cosmos, let me buy. And then they let you buy. You, you see, uh, it's that kind of thing that we get in the text. Uh, so me, it's, it's let me, actually... Let me poke in here. Let me poke in here. Yeah, real go quick. ahead. I got mm-hmm. to ask you something, because this is really... In- I love everything that you're saying, and, and I want to do this again. I hope both of you gentlemen will. Um, I, I have to ask, as we're... we're going off into some really good territory, but your book today, I was reading Paul and Jesus. And of course, Dr. Litwitz mentioned this, that Paul says that the law was given by angels. These angels are the same ones you're describing. You have to kind of negotiate within the Jesus rules, the cosmos. And, you know, he, you know, in the name of Jesus, and you're telling these angels, but Paul also says that one day they would judge these angels or judge the angels What's going on with Paul saying the law was delivered by angels? That (laughs) seems highly suspicious to me from what I've heard from you, Dr. Litwa, you, Dr. Tabor. I've heard it from Dr. Price. Others who are kind of looking outside of the box and not in the sanitized, orthodox, Lutheran, whatever you want to call it, Catholicizing box. Why is the law given by angels? Isn't that kind of a slam in a way? What's going on there? It's certain. Well, David, you go ahead. I talked quite a bit before, <laughs> but I'll, I'll talk. I'll add something to what you say, and I, we probably agree on it. So, well, so it, it deals with a larger question of Paul and later Gnostic Christian traditions. I think, and what's important to, to recognize is, although in the early 20th century there was a, a move to make Paul into a Gnostic or, or make Paul the first Gnostic. Uh, that's a bit of an overstatement, but but I think what's important to recognize is that Paul has a very similar cosmology as what, say, later second century Christian Christians who called themselves Gnostics, which with just which just means knowers. Okay, they're they're spiritual knowers. They are endowed with spiritual knowledge. They have a cosmology where on the lower levels. Okay, they disagree on how many levels, but on the lower levels, they all agree that there is a war going on, and it's between spirits. And when we say spirits in the in the modern world, we may think of totally invisible and incorporeal beings. But I think Paul and later philosophers like Porphyry, I think they were quite concrete and said that these beings are made out of some kind of substance, which was something like air or refined air and that on a you know that they actually breathed in the smoke of the sacrifices and that their bodies kind of looked a bit smoky but they were normally just invisible meaning that they were clear or diaphanous but they were entirely material beings Uh, and that's uh that's important i think to recognize almost Um, like if you're walking on a road and it's hot and you see the, you see the mirage of the, 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 the the mirage of uh, steam or whatever you'd like to say, heat coming off the road. That looks like that would be a spirit in a way to them, I suspect. Right. Exactly. Yeah. They had, they believed in ether or, or ether if you prefer. And so some of these beings an ether just means that very high refined air um, up in the, up in the stratosphere. And that's what these beings were made out of. So they were invisible and they could do things like give laws to people. Now I think, and this is a passage not very well known, but in the letter to Barnabas, okay, Barnabas 9, verse 4, 
I would urge everyone to go find this. It's in a collection called the Apostolic Fathers, but that just means it's it's in early Christian letters. Barnabas is a pseudonym. The writer of this letter says that an evil angel, and that his Greek here is angelos poniros, an evil or wicked angel gave the Jews physical circumcision in order to deceive them, okay? To play, literally the, the Greek there is, to, he played the sophist with them. These angels tricked the Jews. And so on some level, when you go back to Galatians 13, or Galatians 3.19, you ask, is that really what Paul is saying? Because that's, I think, what Barnabas thinks Paul is saying, that there are actually angels who are bad, who tricked the Jews at Sinai into thinking that many of the laws supposedly given by God were actually transmitted by through channels of these lower rulers who had evil intentions to trick the Jews into obeying weird physical laws like resting every Saturday in a sort of and to hold on to these laws, like not eating pork, in a very superstitious way, and that this was actually not the will of God. Because, of course, we learn from Paul himself that God doesn't desire circumcision anyway, physically. And so this is something, in terms of the reception of Paul, that really has to be kept in mind. I think that that could be very well what Paul was saying. I think Dr. Tabor might agree in some way. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, but well, let me jump in. I, I do agree in some way. Now, it could be uh, simply the idea of secondary or intermediaries, meaning not direct enough. You know, God has to just all the way back to sort of a platonic idea that the the unnamed, nameless one has to have a logos or a way of operating but I tend to go with David because not only do you have Galatians 3, but keep reading Galatians 4. And you have the stoikeia to cosmu. Now, it was translated, what, in the King James, something like uh, elements of the world. And everybody's like, I don't know what that is. But we're pretty sure it's elemental spirits of the cosmos. And remember, he also talks about the form of the cosmos is passing away. In 1 Corinthians 7. So these are beings that uh, we usually say tutelatory beings that uh, could, I, I wouldn't want to make them satanic with a capital S, but he does name, he says, you observe days, seasons, months, and years, and you were free from all that. And he uses the word we, like once we were under the tutelage of these beings, but now we're free. He's not just talking about some abstract thing like, oh, my sins were forgiven. He is talking about, and it, it also comes up in a secondary letter, even more directly, Colossians 2, 16 and 17, in which he says these uh, touch not, taste not, handle not, regulations that all have to do with regulating the flesh, you see? So he, he definitely is leaning in that direction. And yet I think he thinks certainly the, the 10 words as they're called were given, you know, by God, even if it was through an intermediator. But isn't it interesting, he says the Torah was added because of transgressions until the seed would come as if uh, you've got this sort of fundamental what moral way from Abraham to Moses. But then what was, Abraham wasn't living according to all of these things necessarily, you see, as he wasn't a, a Jew with the full 613 laws of the Torah in operation, but Paul was. And, and I'm, of course, using that number in terms of the way modern Orthodox count the commandments, but half of which have to do with the temple. But the temple was standing when Paul wrote. And, and so uh, I, 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 I think I lean toward what David's saying, that it's, it's not, I don't think it's full-blown Gnosticism with a capital G. You know, like an evil, wicked force gave these things. But that because of the sinfulness of the Jewish people, here's Barnabas again, 
uh, God just said, you know, you're worshiping the golden calf while I'm giving the 10 words to Moses. And I come down and you're reveling and having a well sex party and getting drunk. And Paul mentions that. This is not just me going back to Exodus. 1 Corinthians 10, he mentions it. He talks about our fathers who passed through the sea and they ate and drank the spiritual food. But then God was not pleased with them. So it's almost like God gave them over to, you know what he says in Romans 1 about the, quote, pagans mm -hmm. who go into all kinds of sin. That's a principle of his that God finally just says, okay, just go with it. You know, because you just, you, unless you change, you're, you're just headed for damnation. And you almost get the idea, I wouldn't go so far as damnation, but like you ancient Israelites, you are so far from really seeing the light of Christ, you know, and remember he says the rock that followed them was Christ. This is mm -hmm. Paul. So some sort of Christ spirit is manifested back then, but that's not what the law as Paul now understands it. And as his opponents are trying to enforce on his free believers in Christ, uh, I think there is something cosmic going on. If know? I might add just one caveat as we get into the next super chat, I'll go ahead and bring it up so I can ask it once I make this point. In Dr. Tabor's book, he brings up that situation in Acts where you have James confronting Paul. And he's saying to him, like, look, uh, now we know Paul, something like this. We know that you weren't telling Jews to stop circumcising, were you? You know, yeah. like, 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 and, and Paul never says anything. Acts just has James talk, but Paul does the ritual and like, hey, we're on the same. We're good, right? I paid. Uh, all right, we're good. But is this not harmonization? And is this not a voice, right? A voice that's at least saying someone is thinking Paul's telling Jews, hey, not even you need to keep this thing anymore. So we need to cut it all out, I guess, because it's become a stumbling block to, to following Christ. I, I well, it's past more than that. It's obsolete in passing. Now that the seed has come, you're no longer under these two latory powers. You know, you're it, it's uh, it's passing away. Why would you buy into a system that is essentially either obsolete or becoming obsolete? And uh, does he anticipate some sort of destruction of the temple and that sort of thing in his apocalyptic imagination? All we have to go on is Second Thessalonians, which most scholars don't think is uh, absolutely verse by verse from the hand of Paul. But he does talk about a man of sin sitting in the temple of God. It's going to get destroyed and so forth. So it could be that he's expecting a final uh, roundup of things at the end of the age and maybe expects to live to see it. Remember, Caligula already tried to put his statue in the temple in 41, right? According to, to some of the records that we have. Nero's not exactly a real stable guy, right? Uh, when he's writing a lot of his letters. And so uh, maybe he's anticipating, but he thinks it's all passing away. It's yeah. all, it's obsolete. I mean, I would take it. And he thinks these uh, powers have been defeated. If they did have some function from Moses to Christ, as he calls it, that parenthetical period when you're under these forces, you're not under them anymore. So why would he says, why would you go back and put yourself under slavery to the stoichia, stoichia to cosmo, these uh elemental spirits of the universe that David was describing. You don't, you, you're above those. You don't have to, uh, within the fold of, of the community, the yakad, rather call it the yakad than the church, the, the group, you know, the together group, you're protected. And Qumran has the same thing. They think they're protected. They think the angels are watching over them, the good angels. And you don't want to be outside of that, that arena. Okay, Doc Pleromanot, the super chat. Many passages attest to a physical resurrection, but what of the ascension? Has the teaching of the bodily ascension been merely assumed? 2 Corinthians 5, I think, sheds light as the body being reclothed. David, would you start us? Sure. Yeah, I 
I tend to think that most Christians of the late first century more or less thought that the resurrection and ascension were the same thing. Um, if you read Paul, the, his uh, meeting the Lord in the air in, in First Thessalonians, um, I think that's basically, he's talking about the resurrection or the mass resurrection or the general resurrection, which happens when Jesus returns. But that's also obviously an ascension. I mean, you're, you're being resurrected into the air. And uh, Jesus' attributed final words on the cross to the thief, today you'll be with me in paradise, indicates that that's a fairly instant rise. Um, and whenever you go to heaven, I think you that's a very physical thing. You have to get some sort of physical body. The ancients uh, thought that you know, the higher you go, you need uh, a suit, as it were, or a kind of body that fits the ecology, that is the celestial ecology. Just as if I were to go to Mars right now, I couldn't survive in this particular body. I would need to have some sort of spacesuit. I would need to be clothed with some sort of spacesuit um, that uh, enabled me to survive in uh, the Mars environment. And that's very concretely how they thought about rising to heaven. So your resurrection to heaven it requires you to go to a different ecology and it requires a different form of body. And the analogies that Paul uses about being clothed, he says, right now our body's like a tent, but in 1 Corinthians, or sorry, 2 Corinthians 5, our body will be like a temple. It'll be much more permanent and stable. I think it will still be quite material, but it'll be made out of something like photonic uh, energy. Uh, sort of like, uh, I mean, we never, he never exactly says what the soma pneumaticon or the spirit body is made out of. But I would guess, based on his imagery, it's something like a star body. And stars, for Paul, are real bodies up there. Mm -hmm. They are photonic bodies that last for a very long time, much longer than our human mortal bodies, which just grow old and decay. For us, that takes about 80 years. For people in the ancient world, you'd be lucky to live to 40. So that's as long as this body is going to last. And that's in, so this is really important that it's really only the author of Acts, whom I think is second century, who wants to make a firm break between Jesus's resurrection and the ascension, separating them by 40 days. That's a, that's an innovation, I think. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to move on to a couple other super chats. Let me add time. one thing to that. Okay. Um, uh, to to uh, Pleroma, Dr. Pleroma. Um, I'm glad you mentioned 2 Corinthians 5 because you also have tentless or nakedness. So you're tentless and then you get a permanent house. He switches his metaphors, but both are fine. And the other is you're uh, clothed and then you're naked and reclothed, but he, he says, you, you have to look at the last verses of chapter four. We look to the things above, not the things below, for the things above are eternal and the things below are temporal. So it really has to do with a mortal realm below. And as David said, as you go higher, it gets more ethereal. And finally, what you could call immortal, at least not sub Im, immortal means not mortal like not death, right? So you go up as you go. But he says the point is not to be naked, but to be further clothed. And so the naked state, I take it, is some sort of interim state, perhaps, before the parousia. And that's not your hope. So it's almost like he quotes a kind of platonic sounding uh, idea at the end of chapter four. And then he says, but we, we don't just want that. Otherwise, hey, the bird out of the cage, you don't need the body. But he, he thinks you do need a body. You need a mode of existence in this uh, new creation that he thinks is beginning to emerge. And to put a point blank, though, he does not mean the literal, physical, absolute, same exact body that we have now, right? Absolutely. No, but You wouldn't survive in heaven with this body. Yeah. Got it. You couldn't. I, I, I just, 
I think in Mark, uh, particularly, if you take the short, the proper ending, the verse eight of chapter 16, I, Norman Perrin taught me this at Chicago, and I call Norman Perrin Mr. Mark, you know, I really respect what he said. And he, he thinks that, uh, and he's not the only one who said this, but he thought that uh, the reason you don't have resurrection appearances is because Jesus has ascended. Now there's resurrection as ascension. So if you want to read about Jesus being uh, ascended or raised from the dead, I agree with David. It's the same thing. You would really go to the trans, so-called transfiguration, probably the most misnamed thing in the New Testament, uh, which is what Mark 9, where they see this uh, Moses and Elijah in this visionary state. And as if they're already uh, passing into this upper realm and shining like the stars forever, to quote Daniel 12 and so forth. Uh, and then it poofs away and everybody's like, whoa, what was that? And they're all excited because they think, yeah, that's what we want. Is that ahead? And he goes, actually, the cross is ahead. That's Mark's thing. Like, yeah, that was really a great thing. But uh, we're not doing that now. We're going to. We're going to get nailed to crosses first. And uh, so I don't, I think to, for Mark to have a physical appearances like eating fish and stuff like that, that would just totally destroy his understanding. And uh, uh, Luke, Luke, and of course, John only picks that up uh, very, very late. And I think it is more of a second century thing. I think it's apologetic. It's because people were saying, well, how do you know we didn't, you didn't see a ghost? Now, how would I know that's why? Because it's mentioned in the text. Yeah, we didn't see a ghost. We didn't um, see it. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to, we only got 30 minutes left or 33. You go. So, yeah. Um, Hella waits. Thank you for the 20. Uh, I'm going to ask the question anyway. It's an opinion because really uh, you can give your own thoughts. Great show as always. Was Paul gay? Now, Dr. Tabor and I have actually interviewed on this topic, at least the thorn in Paul's side. He gives his two cents on it. Uh, Rabbi Tovia Singer, of course, came on and said he thinks Paul was gay, or at least struggled with something like that. Um, what? Let's start with David, uh, since you had the final word, and then we'll flip back to you, Dr. Tabor. Yeah, I can be brief, because all of this is, is speculation, but I th there's a great... So if, if you think that Paul wasn't attracted to women, that's one thing. But if you're not, a, if you're, and he probably wasn't, uh, if you're not attracted to women, though, there is a range of other things that you can be besides gay. Right. And I would put my money on something like asexual. Um, uh, I don't know, but I, I suspect that that may be the case. And I, I, I do have more information on later second century Christians uh, like Julius Cassianus and some very ascetic or sometimes called encratite Christians, whom I think were basically a asexual. They didn't feel attraction either way. But again, yeah, I think we would need a time machine to answer this one. Right. Dr. Tabor? And I, I agree. We just don't know. But I would lean more towards the idea that he's struggling with uh, sexual temptation of some type in Romans 7, when he says, the good that I would, I do not, and so forth. And even though it's translated coveting, you know, in the old King James, and that passes into all the translations, uh, it, it, it's something about the flesh. And I don't think it's like, oh, I have a bad temper, or I tend to lie a lot, or I don't know why I'm not a kinder person. I think he's really facing something. And he's trying to live a celibate life. He says that. And he says it's a gift that you get. But we know from all of the spiritual experiences of early Christianity, when people give this a try, it often just exasperates uh, their dreams and visions and imaginations. You know, you can't control your dreams, according to Freud. And so I picture him even, you know, I suggested to you, as you know, that the thorn in the flesh, so-called, was in fact uh, sexual temptation. And uh, he wants to be away from the body at home with the Lord. But while he's in the body, he's got this struggle. He's seen all of this glory, you know, Second Corinthians 10, which I uh, wrote the book about. 
but he has to come back down to earth and face the flesh. But again, pure speculation. Uh, but I don't think uh, I would. Re I would think it's more likely that he's tempted by women, asexual, than that he's gay. Because I don't know any evidence of that, and he's pretty hard on uh, you know homosexual kinds of things in Romans one and. First Corinthians five, six, I guess, and so forth. I know it can be interpreted in a more open way, but yeah, he doesn't seem to draw many nuances. He just gets very worked up about it. Now, if you want to psychoanalyze Paul, you could say, why is he screaming and yelling in Romans one about these horrible, despicable, nasty, dirty things these people are doing? We've noticed in our own day and time that the preachers that reel most against such things turn out later to uh, be facing some of their own temptations, right? That's true. So, it's a guessing knows? game. It's a guessing it's game. It's a guessing game, yeah. Yeah. Sobek, Lord of the Four Corners, he is also a patron of Dr. David Litwa. And uh, thanks for being this, the patron and a friend of Myth Vision. So his question is, should we understand Paul's soteriology as a apotheosis as in... Um, and he actually sent me an email to give me the the meaning of these. Paul's ascent to paradise, P A T P, or oh, I'm going to start using that. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> or W A B T, which is we are being transformed. Can you elaborate on these concepts? Which of these fits best within this cultural milieu? Uh, go ahead, David. I'm well, I, you've written I, the most about apotheosis. I um, <laughs> I really appreciate the the question, Jason. I I I think that for me, apotheosis and deification are the same thing. Um, or at least I use them uh, mm -hmm. synonymously. So th there's no worries there. And and what what deification means is is quite literally becoming a Deus, which is a god. And what's a god in the Greco-Roman world? You have to ask that question rather than what what is a god today what's a god in the greek roman world well a god in the greek roman world is a being of death of deathless life that is an immortal being usually with superhuman power and power can be conceived in very many ways you could have great intelligence great beauty uh, or some great strength as we see in, in Heracles or Hercules. So both of those elements together shows you why it was very logical for, I think, a lot of people in the greek roman world to very logically and rationally say that the uh, Roman emperor was a god. He's referred to just with that simple word theos, god in Greek in literally thousands of inscriptions. And they aren't just playing games or political games, okay? They they do think that on some level there is an immortal genius or genius to the emperor and that the emperor obviously does demonstrate a kind of superhuman power. Sometimes they perform miracles. We've seen that in the case of Vespasian. So it, it is the case, I think, that you could rationally believe in the ancient world that a human being became a god or was a god or and also a god on earth. And there's nothing illogical or irrational about that. And Paul goes around the Greco-Roman world spreading a gospel, which is a political message of good news and beneficence, saying that, guess what, everybody? You can become immortal just like the Roman emperor or just like Heracles or Asclepius or Romulus. And you also can have superhuman power. How do you get superhuman power for Paul? Well, as we talked about earlier, judging angels, you get the cosmic power. When the cosmos is reformed, it, it's sort of like, uh, yeah, it, it's sort of like imagine an empire, right? An evil empire gets taken over and then there's a rehashing and a total re restructuring of who gets the political power. Yeah. So Christians are going to be the ones sort of, you know, on Jesus's side, you know, the new ruler's side. And so will, you know, the Christians conceive of themselves as getting that extreme cosmic power because 
When you're on the cosmic level, your political power is cosmic power. So all those evil angels and spirits who are running around now bothering Christians, Christians are going to get back at them and rule them when the cosmos is reformed, as it were. So Christians will have both immortal life, deathlessness, and super cosmic power, superhuman power. And that is why the Pauline message of salvation is a message of deification. And that is simply reading Paul in his Greco-Roman context. Mm. Mm. So this is where I want to jump in. Totally agree. And um, go to Philippians 2. Because okay. Philippians 2, we have this uh, so-called hymn. It's usually seen as pre-Pauline. And uh, many New Testament scholars are, are people that work on these texts are suggesting, this isn't my idea, Charles Talbert has one of the most earliest articles on this, is that it's not about a pre-existent divine being who gave up divinity, became a human, died on a cross, and then was highly exalted, sort of the round trip, like divine being, comes down, shows the way, goes back up, and that would be an example of service and sacrifice. And I've become convinced by Talbert and others, James Dunn, others hold this view, the late James Dunn, uh, Jimmy, uh, my friend, uh, he, uh, that Paul has a, an Adam Christology here. So as soon as you hear it, it just clicks. Though he was in the form of God, hmm, Adam, made in the image of God, first Adam. So second Adam is a human being, and so he's a he's he's, you know, he's mortal Adam, Adam of the flesh, so to speak. He did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped. What did Adam do in the Eden story? I want to grasp that fruit. And what does the Nakash say? I'm not going to call him the devil, but the Nakash, the shining one. He says, uh, if you do that, you will you'll have uh, knowledge of good and evil and you'll be like God. So here we have a second Adam. He, he's an Adam. He's flesh and blood, Jesus. But he doesn't go that route to get equality with God. Instead, he empties himself takes on the form of a servant, and finally dies on a cross, and therefore God exalts him. This is Paul's servant theology. In other words, Philippians uh, 2 is not about, Je it's about Jesus, but it's supposed to be a model for everybody. Like you're destined to become equal with God. Do you not know the saints will judge the world? But how are you gonna get that power? Uh, Mark is very influenced by Paul, and he, the whole book of Mark is about this. Don't seek glory, power, don't put yourself first, right? Because then you're going to be last. But if you empty yourself and become a servant, or even a doulos, a slave, even stronger word, then you can be exalted. And so you think of all the passages in Paul, even Romans 8, which is his most glorified chapter, he says, provided that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified with him. So if you try to skip the suffering and grab that fruit like Adam and Eve did in the garden, you're just going to end up outside the gates of Eden and you're going to die. Dust you are, to dust you will return. But if you act like this Adam, this is the Adam example, then you can get highly exalted to the right hand of God. Now, mo many people would say, well, wait, it, it, it's, it doesn't, he highly exalted him, not you. Uh, sit at my right hand until I make uh, your enemies of a stool for your feet. Paul makes it very clear that the saints are going to, to be exalted. And Jesus is the firstborn of many, right? So he showed how to do it. Dr. I think Taylor. that... Yes. Can you turn your camera a little more? We're, we're, you're starting to ascend out of the camera, and we're worried. You you're... know, when I did my PhD exams on this book, you know, I'd written the dissertation and all, the the oral. 
uh, Jonathan Smith, he's such a joker. He said, James, if you will ascend from your chair during the exam, even three feet from your chair, just and carry it out, you know, all the questions, we will we'll stop the exam and pass you without going further. <laughs> and I tried. <laughs> But I just I just sunk into the chair. So oh man. Well so, did you sorry did you David, did you have a comment? Do you agree with that assessment or do you think it's likely or what is your opinion on it? And then we'll move on to the super chats as we're getting close to the end of this episode. Um, I don't agree, but it's not important. It's too it's too much of a minutia question to to be bothered. So let, let's just go to the super chats. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'd like to get your thoughts one day then. Um, Brian, thank you for the super chat. I understand the authentic letters of Paul were written by the same person, but how do we know that was in fact, Paul? Um, <laughs> well, uh, I guess, you know, one of the things to keep in mind for scholarship in the humanities is that this is not science this is not dealing with absolute uh, truths and things that a dogmatic points. Okay, so yes, all that we have in the manuscripts are uh, letters that are signed or starting with Paulos, which is the Greek word for Paul. And all that scholars have done since the 19th century is to determine that based on stylistic criteria, theology, and other factors, that seven of these appear to be authentic. Whereas the others, sometimes five, sometimes six, depending on you know how you how you gear things, um, the others are not authentic. So that's where we are. And that's that's all that we can pretend to know. But I, I think that yeah, this isn't this isn't science. I mean, we we just don't actually absolutely know for sure. But that's because we don't know anything for sure. But that doesn't mean that we can't still do scholarship based on the best of all hypotheses to move forward. Well said. Well said. All right, I'll move on to the next one then. Vaguely agnostic with the six six six. Thank you for the super chat. Two Tar Hills. And a guy from Australia walk into a bar. Great show, guys. I learned a lot. You know, we're going to be uh, down in Israel, and you could say two Tar Heels in Israel walk into a bar. Uh, we'll do that in October at some point, I'm sure, and uh, we'll have fun. Neil will be there, too. Thank you for that super chat and support. Scott Daniel, Paul, Paul uses Morphe from Form in Philippians 2. Is this the same term used for image of God in the Septuagint? I think so. Yes, it's uh, so in Morphe. Um, yeah, is is a bit different than Econ. Um, and Econ is the the word in Genesis one twenty six. Um, but I'll I'll have to I'll have to check. Um, and uh, this has been a while. But in Genesis five, if I could just pull it up here. Um, yeah, the, yeah. The the phrase is katikana there as well too. So that means uh, according to the image. But interestingly, when when Adam gives birth to Seth, uh, the, mm -hmm. the Greek changes just a little bit to katitane Dan. Um, but uh, as far as I can see, Morphe uh, is actually distinctive in Philippians two, and and so then the. The exegetical or linguistic question is why why use that term? And there's a good article on this by Steenberg, uh, if you're able to look it up, uh, on the distinctive use of morphe and whether that would have a different meaning than acon. Um, they are generally viewed as synonyms, but there there are definitely different nuances. Thank you so much. A Gnostic informants in the chat. He said, with a Gnostic. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just wanted to catch up. I don't like to leave anyone hanging. I'm going to take down this banner while we have, uh, let's see, 12, 13 minutes left hanging out, talking to you guys. Um, what was I going to bring up earlier? 
there was something in particular that you were talking about, Dr. Tabor, that came to my mind. I'd be interested in just hearing both of you talking back and forth and not me or audience interjecting. Would you guys have something you'd like to maybe carry further in the conversation? I would like to ask David, because I think he would know much more about this than I do, um, to what degree in the East, uh, you know, we have Greek Orthodox theologians that talk about why are you so excited about deification? Of course, that's absolutely what the church should be teaching. And Westerners seem to think it's idolatry almost or something like that uh, you're going to become God. But in the fathers, the early fathers, so-called fathers, patriarchs, patristic fathers, um, would you say, David, that uh, there's a general view that uh, humans are going to uh, become as God or as Christ? And it certainly seems to be hinted at in Paul. You know, he's the first of many. And why did it when and how did it become so strange to people that uh, that's the redemptive plan is to redeem humanity into uh, a deified state? Well, that's really important. And it's a question I get into in Becoming Divine, because actually, I mean, Luther has a has a, a doctrine of deification. Um, so, yeah, uh, so that's that's something that, yeah. For some reason, has really been been lost, and I, I I deal actually with the Mormons because I think I give credit to the Mormons for actually bringing back a lot of, or Joseph Smith yeah. specifically for bringing back some of the ancient discourse. But just very very quickly, because we don't have much time, I, I one of the ways you can control your research, like a lot of a lot of scholars. Uh, you know, they get criticized for being too speculative or over speculative. And, and, you know, we're not dealing with scientific disciplines, but we do need control, controls for our research. So someone could could legitimately ask me or you or, or anyone who wants to propose that Paul was talking about deification. Well, does anyone in the ancient world say that Paul's ascent to heaven was a deification? And actually, the answer is yes. The very first person to say that is not a patristic author, but the Nassine preacher. And Nassines, I've, I've given a show with Neil uh, in Gnostic Informant about this, but the Nassine preacher is, an, is, I think, an Alexandrian late second century. And he directly says that Paul became a god when he ascended to the third heaven. And that you that Jesus essentially goes through the same thing because that's what ascension is. Ascension is deification because it requires you to have a different to go into a different ecology and to have a body, a, a soma pneumaticon, a, a spirit body that can survive as an immortal spirit being in those higher heavenly echelons. So that we do have attested that that is also what ancients thought. And that comes from the Nassim preacher. Now, interestingly, when you deal with the Orthodox tradition, and this goes back to, you know, Epistle to Diognetus, it goes back to Clement, it goes back to Augustine. Every all of these people are saying that the truth of salvation is deification. Okay, mm -hmm. and they're using they're using words theopoiesis that that just means God making, right? So they they know what this means, and this is what they preach. But the problem is, and the reason why even I would disagree with modern Greek or or whatever, whatever you Russian Orthodoxy, is that. Beginning in, in the third and fourth century, you have an absolute ontological divide generated in Christian theology. It's part of the developments that went into the, to the Nicene Creed in, in determining why Jesus is a special deified person, right? Because, of course, Christians, by the fourth century, the, the Orthodox camp, they really want to make Jesus special special for obvious reasons. And if you begin saying that we're all becoming gods, that it's a mass deification, then uh, in the Orthodox tradition, Jesus doesn't become special enough, right? And so uh, when I was, I, I was in an interview once uh, and uh, one a very conservative Catholic dean asked me, well, you wrote a book on Jesus Deus, uh, the early Christian depiction of Jesus as, as a Mediterranean God. Don't you mean the Mediterranean God? 
<laughs> and I said, no, absolutely not. But this, this impulse, this Christian impulse to make Jesus special, right, mm -hmm. as a deified person, you, to some extent, Christians agree and have to agree that Jesus is a deified person, but he's becomes so special. And certainly by the late fourth century, when he is fully integrated into the Godhead and the Godhead is fully ontologically hermetically sealed off from the world, then when, when the Orthodox people talk about deification, they don't really mean becoming God, even though Absolutely. that's what the language right. says, right. right? They mean you become a spirit being, Immortal, but, powerful, yeah. But but you are as far away from God ontologically as a piece of grass is as far away from God ontologically. You may even be in the image of God, but ontologically you'll never right. cross what I call the iron ceiling. Mm -hmm. And what's really important to, to keep in mind is that in Paul's day, which again is, is hundreds of years before orthodoxy, those ontological barriers, those philo that philosophical version of Christianity, which with or, which orthodoxy developed, did not yet exist. So that's why studying the earliest part of Christianity, I think, is very fun and rewarding for me. And it's very important for everyone here to understand that not to be anachronistic. And even if you see, you know, in Greek Orthodoxy and in some Roman Catholic traditions that they that they say, oh, yeah, well, Augustine believes in deification. But Augustine also believes that we are made of nothing and that we will never cross the ontological gap into real godhood. So very be very careful that there is a linguistic overlap. But in terms of the philosophical yeah. meaning, they are miles and miles away from Paul. Very well said. Yeah. And, um, you know, Athanasius asked Arius, was there a time when he was not? And that gets right to it. Uh, I mean, reincarnation is a pretty common theme in many traditions in the Hellenistic world. But the notion is if if there was a time if jesus is a created being or christ the logos and there was a time when he was not then uh, you've broken the barrier but if if that if the answer is uh, no then you're with uh, nicaea and of course we have arians today uh i guess the jehovah's witnesses might be called arian and others that uh, Certainly the Ebionites, from what we can tell, seem to uh, go in that direction. But yeah, I'm really glad you pointed that out. You know, I taught at Notre Dame and David Bentley Hart is there now, but David always likes to point out, he's seen interviews with Robert Kuhn on Closer to Truth and so forth, because Robert likes to explore these things. On It's all on YouTube now, but it used to be PBS. And he always points this out, and I always want to ask him exactly what you just said. You know, I'm just listening, and I'm thinking, well, because he's a good translator of the New Testament, and he really does work on the language. But, uh, you know, just to say, oh, in the East they believe in deification can be very misleading, you know, as a corrective to, mm -hmm. say, the modern West. I'm glad you mentioned Luther, too, because... Lots of times we assume that Luther would be sort of like a 19th century evangelical Christian. And Luther was uh, pretty classically trained in uh, Christian theology. So, Yeah, I mean, he knew yeah. medieval theology. Uh, that was his bread and butter as That's a right. yeah. theologist. Too. So he's not going to make that stupid mistake of thinking... Uh, Oh, they mentioned you could become God or he became like us so we could become like him. Well, what do you mean like him? <laughs> the, the, yeah, yeah, there's a there's a <laughs> lot of fudging on that term like. Yeah. People yeah. like to, people like to use that word like or mm -hmm. as, like God or as God, because mm -hmm. in in terms of that like word like, that's only four letters, but it has an infinite ability to stretch its meaning. And so, yeah, yeah it, the, the fudge factor here is incredible. Sort of like what the I mean by <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. yeah so, <laughs> I, I mean, someone someone to sound pious could say, oh, well, I, I believe we can become like God. So that's deification, right? Well, I mean, on the most watered down level 
possible because you're still trying to fit into an orthodox tradition. But really what deification means, not just etymologically, but I think in Paul's day, is it does mean becoming a god. And if your theology has changed so that God is now this inaccessible, ontologically distant, you know, immovable, uh, platonic entity, well, then farewell to deification. But that's not what Christianity started with. And that's yeah. really important to know. Very good. Uh, gentlemen, real quick, got a couple chats and we want to close out here. Jason Stewart said, did Paul see Jesus? as demiurge like the Posag the Posagony? is that right that's a david question for sure <laughs> <laughs> well i would say I, no but <laughs> I, I can if i don't know uh Pasagini or however what what's being asked here exactly but I, I i actually i do think that paul did see jesus as a demiurgic uh figure um of course, this really only becomes clear in Colossians, and that's only yeah. um, that that's probably not Paul, but uh, some disagree on that. Uh, but but yeah, I, I think on some level, uh, Jesus could be a creating things. And, and one of the things that gives you power in the cosmic realm is that your ability to create things. So if there's a wisdom Christology at play here, wisdom as we know from the book of Proverbs, is also a demiurgic being who is playing along with God, the creator, at the beginning of time. It doesn't mean that she is, you know, the ultimate God, but that ability to create things is a sign of power. Thank you so much for that. I had one more on the email sent by Jojo Freelancer. How did Jesus go to heaven? If the earth is round, did he walk in another dimension? He went with a physical body to God's right hand. Is God physical too? Does Yahweh have two natures? And Muslims worship God. And if Jesus is half God, are the Muslims saved too, according to Christianity? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot there. <laughs> but you have to answer it in 30 seconds. No, that's, I'm just kidding. Why, that's an hour and a half program in a couple of weeks, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, call us back for that one. Um, yeah, no. I, just a very short though the answer yes they i mean they believe the earth is round okay they're not flat earthers in in the ancient world yes you do rise in a physical body but it's not this body it's a more like a star or astral or ethereal body yes i mean that does make you divine and you're not half divine you're 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 fully divine as for me as long as you're an immortal being with superhuman cosmic power you've graduated yeah. into the category of God. So there you go. He said, is and God I think, physical I, I think the terms material, spiritual, all of our assumptions about them, even in science today, you know, it's like we, we just conveniently forget Einstein with our famous little formula we learned in eighth grade about E equals, e equals MC squared. And we just talk... Uh, you know, about metaphysics and physics and the material world and the spiritual world, as if those are the categories that you're going to have in these Hellenistic texts. And as David already mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, you can have a pneumacos pen, body, you know, soma, but what does that mean? You know, is it like an air hose puffing around or it, it's just assuming a physics that is not really uh, the physics that people imagine in their language. Thank so. you so much. I, I wanted to jab one more, uh, just a jab. This is a jab by Ken McCracken. Christ is God over all, blessed forever, according to Paul in Romans, not created. Well, again, translation. That's the same verse we talked about before. Textual yeah. problems, too. Um, and textual it, actually, problems, the, yeah. the grammar is disputed in Romans 9, 5. So yeah. you should go back to the Greek there, Ken, and work that out very carefully and check the commentaries. Yeah. Check the Hermeneia or the Anchor Bible, particularly, because they would... Uh, and then tons of articles if you look at JSTOR and do a search for, you know, even the verse, uh, you'll get unbelievable amounts of material.